I'm Maria. I am the owner of AZ Suds, which is Arizona's handmade soap and more. And today I'm going to show you how to make cold process soap. Step-by-step -step tutorial with a lot of information in here. So you might want to get your pen and paper and write some stuff down because uh, we're going into detail here. A lot of times I say on my vlogging channel when I do vlogs is if you don't make a gigantic mess, that means you're not doing it right. So as you can see, this is my workstation and my workstation is in my garage. The reason why it's in my garage is because you're working with lye and you do not want to have that around anywhere in the kitchen where you prepare food. If you have pets, kids, you don't want anybody exposed to that stuff. I've already made one batch today, which means I need to clean the top of this. But I got my big pot right here, and this is what we're going to measure the oils out in. And uh, then we got our lye water bowl right here. We put distilled water in that, add the lye, and I'll take you through everything, exactly how we do it. Every recipe is different for uh, making soap. Uh, soapers keep their recipes under a tight lid of exactly how much of each oils you use. I'm not going to divulge my recipe, my quantities of stuff, but I will tell you what's in it. I have no problem with that. So let's start off with pouring the oil because that's the first thing we got to get done is get the oils mixed together. It's always good to have a scale so you can uh, measure it. I mean this will not work unless you have a scale. And let me set you right up there. And the first oil I'm going to work with is the one that doesn't pour very well unless it's uh, heated up. And that is my coconut oil. When you're measuring your oils, your distilled water for, and your lye, everything, everything that you measure out, you must have exact amounts. If you don't, your soap might have too much lye in it or not enough lye in it. And one thing about lye heavy soap is you can't use it because there's too much lye to be saponified during the saponification process. And if you don't have enough lye, you end up with um, a bar that is way too fatty and doesn't have a good cleaning quality. So you've got to be very careful on your measurements. I make my soap bars out of three different types of oils. You can use many, many oils. Uh, Castile soap uh, is actually made of strictly olive oil. But uh, I like to mix three different oils together. That way we get the moisturizing effects of one oil, the uh, hardness of a bar in another oil. And it's, uh, it's a science. This is definitely a science. Okay, got my oil. And since I'm in my garage and it's in the middle of summer and I'm in Arizona, I'm going to be sweating. So you're probably going to see some sweat on my brow. Okay, the next oil I use is olive oil. The next oil I use is soybean. Soybean is vegetable oil most of the time. You're going to have to look at the label. You just uh, take a look and see exactly what the ingredients are. If I can find it, here it is. So the ingredients, soybean oil. Okay, here are my oils. It's all in here. That uh, chunky stuff, that's the coconut oil. But once it gets heated up, of course, it turns into a liquid. So I'm going to set that right over here and then get ready to pour uh, my water for lye and then mix the lye together, which is the most dangerous part of doing this whole thing. All soap is made with water. You have to use distilled water. Okay, I don't ask me why, but you have to use distilled water. I guess you could use the stuff from the, from the tap. But that's filled with certain minerals and things that um, might interact with your fragrance and with your oil concoction. So it's best just to use distilled water. And every recipe has a different amount that you should use, depending on how, many, uh, how much oil you have, what the lye content is. So you just got to make sure you measure your water out absolutely perfect. Sometimes soapers will say you can do a water discount on your um, your recipe to get a harder bar faster. I do not recommend doing that. Uh, the best thing to do is just stick to your recipe. Let, in a sense, nature take its course when the soap cures. 
because you could like that's a good way to end up with a lie heavy bar trying to cheat your way of um, helping things speed up faster is not always the best course of action. All right, and I take my bowl that my lye is going to be mixed in, and I just set that aside. Now, when you're a beginner doing this, it's all about lye safety, okay? Lye is not something you want to screw with. When I first started doing this, I even wore a face mask. <laughs> But that turned out to be uh, something I didn't need after a while. Once you learn how to do it and you feel comfortable with it, um, you still need your gloves, you still need your eye protection. But as you can see, I'm wearing short sleeves, but I've done this so many times, I'll be all right. Yeah, one thing you need to keep in mind is your lie safety. So I do highly recommend wearing long pants, shoes, long sleeve shirt, big gloves, and goggles because you, uh, you do not want lye on you anywhere. Now the lye that I use is the same stuff you can get in the hardware store. I do not recommend flakes. Lye can get, uh, you can buy lye in flakes or you can buy it in little tiny uh, pebbles. This is the pebble type, basically a consistency of sand and uh, it's just regular drain cleaner lie, household lie. has to be 100% lie. If you don't have 100% lie, you're going to make something that's going to hurt you really bad. So you got to get 100% lie. And I get these at Ace Hardware for about $3.60 something a bottle. So let me pour in how much lie I need. Any material you use with lie, it is very, very important that you do not use plastic containers to hold your lie. Now something I'm using right now is very quick, which is a plastic spoon, to um, take the additional lye I had in there out. But that spoon is used once and immediately thrown away. You should pour your lye into glass containers. The lye water should be a glass container. Now when you mix your lye, this is the fun part right here. Whenever you mix lye, you have to use stainless steel on your spoon. If you don't use stainless steel or use something that is aluminum or any other uh, kind of uh, metal, you will have extremely toxic fumes come out of this and it can kill you. As it is, when I mix this lye into the water, we're gonna have fumes. And as soon as I'm done mixing it, I have to leave the garage, open up the garage doors, so the air can uh, circulate because the fumes that come out from this when you first mix it can kill you if you breathe it in. So you want to pour slowly and stir very carefully when you do this and stand back. If you don't pour slowly you can end up with a live volcano on your hands, and nobody wants that. You want to make sure all the live crystals are dissolved. And you're going to periodically stir this until it cools down, too. Okay, don't rest your spoon on a, on a towel or on the counter. Put it in another glass container. I got my measuring cup right there for as another glass container. Let's take a reading, the temperature. That's how hot that just got, 189.5 degrees. So let's leave, open up my garage doors, and get out of here. Okay, getting the oil heated up is the only part you're gonna be doing in your stove. Because you need to have this, this close to the same temperature that the lye water is or uh, you're going to have a big problem on your hands when you try and mix the two together. I soap it around 120, 125 degrees. So you have to get the soap and the lye water about 15, no, actually no more than 15 degrees of one another. Preferably five. But I, I kind of do it right around five to seven degrees of each other. So if one is, um, see this has some ways to go. 
Uh, the lye water is currently cooling down, but uh, it's kind of like finding the sweet spot. You got to determine how high you want this to go versus how hot it is out there in the lye water bowl because the lye water is going to lose its heat faster than sitting in a stainless steel pot um, with the oil. So if that's 180 something degrees, I'm going to heat this up to about 145 and then I'm going to let them sit. And when I go in there and check the lye water, it's probably going to be right around 125 somewhere in there. And this is going to be right around 128. Usually that's how it happens. If you don't have a mud porch, if you don't have a, a sink in your garage, you're going to end up having to wash your uh, pots and everything in your, your kitchen. Just make sure that no other utensils or anything is around when you do it. And just rinse everything thoroughly. Um, whatever you use for soaping, you cannot use it for anything else. So, I mean, I got two pots, two stainless steel pots that I use. Um, I swap out when I'm done with one batch. That way I got a clean one to go after another, another batch. But um, whatever you use, all utensils, everything, your mixer, everything is dedicated for soap making. No matter what. These things right here are a gift from heaven that tell you the temperature of something from, by a laser. They are a gift from heaven. See the little red dot on the wall there? I would not recommend a candy thermometer because uh, after a while, lye will make glass break. The, pot, the, pot, or pots. <laughs> the bowls I'm using are thick glass. Candy thermometer glass is not as thick. I highly recommend getting one of these digital thermometers um, above and beyond anything else to measure the temperature of uh, your oils and your lye water. Get my oil heated up. That's about right. So now that the garage is aired out and those fumes are gone, I'm going to go bring this into the garage. I'm waiting for my lye water and my oil to cool down. Let's talk fragrances. There's so many fragrances out there that it's your, your, your imagination is the limit of using one straight up for what it is or mixing it with something else to get a totally new fragrance. You can use fragrance oils or essential oils. The difference between the two is fragrance oils are um, lab created whereas essential oils are derived from an actual plant source. What I'm using today is um, called Egyptian Amber. It is one of my top selling fragrances uh, in everything that I do and I do soaps, bath bombs and even wax melts. But Egyptian Amber is very sought after and it is actually made with essential oils. So it's got a whole bouquet of different essential oils and I really wish you guys could smell what I'm smelling. Oh my god. This smells so darn good. Uh, if you want to smell it head on over to my Etsy and I've, I do have some Egyptian Amber bath bombs available. I don't have any soap left because everybody bought it. That's why I'm making some batches of Egyptian Amber right now. Um, it's July 2016 so uh, in the end of August 2016 is when my Egyptian Amber will be ready to go. If you're watching this video after that head over to my Etsy. The link is in the description of this video and you can uh, get some for yourself. But uh, depending on the fragrance oil and essential oils, sometimes you might run into problems with your soap batter. When you mix everything together, you want to put the lye water very slowly into the oil. And once that's in there, you use a stick blender like this. This is a stick blender. And when you put it down into the, the pot, you want to shake it a little bit so that there's no air bubbles trapped underneath this. There's little openings you can see that air bubbles can get out of. You want to shake it because you don't want to foam up your soap batter. And you get the lye water and your oils emulsified. And once they're emulsified, that's when you can add your fragrance. Sometimes there's bad reactions that happen with fragrance oils and essential oils. And you can have your soap batter seize instantly, which means it basically turns into soap on a stick. 
Um, you can have ricing where it looks like it's turned into like a rice pudding. Uh, you can have acceleration where the soap batter doesn't necessarily seize really fast, but it starts getting thick really fast. And in cases like that, you just want to get it into your mold as fast as possible. That's why you want to have your lye water poured first into your oils and get that emulsified because if you add that with your fragrance oil, you're not sure about the fragrance oil and it accelerates, you might not have complete emulsification between the lye water and your oils. Um, it's best to do a small, small batch when trying out a new fragrance oil or essential oil to see how it reacts with the type of oils that you use. Um, I've had many, many fragrances that are uh, problematic. Um, some pointers to make sure you're getting the right fragrance because essential oils do cost a lot more than regular fragrance oils. And sometimes with fragrance oils, um, it's, you know, it's cheaper to go that route. And there's nothing wrong with the fragrance oils. I mean, that's what you get in perfumes and things like that. But sometimes certain sellers will cut the fragrances, which means they will add more alcohol to it or more water, and it's, it's a cut fragrance. Now, those might work good for bath bombs. They might work good for um, bath bombs. Not necessarily for making cold processed soap or making even uh, wax melts. If you do melt and pour soap, it could work for that. Um, Cutting the fragrance is um, taking away the properties of the fragrance. It's, it's adding other things to it to try and expand your stock of fragrance. And some sellers, they, they do it and you end up having soaps that are just, it's completely destroyed, a big waste of money. We all know olive oil, coconut oil, you know, vegetable oil is fairly cheap, thank God, but uh, that stuff is expensive. and. Once you get all the supplies and everything together and you start making your homemade soaps, to have a batch just completely get destroyed because a seller was not being honest with their product and they say something is uncut when in fact it really is, it really sucks. So the best thing to do is go from reputable sellers. I've gone through some sellers on eBay thinking I could save a buck and I had a nightmare on my hands with all these fragrances that I just could not use. Um, a good place out there is a place that would say that they have tested their uh, essential oils and their fragrance oils in soap making. Granted, their mix of oils might not be what you used, but typically if you have a good reaction to a fragrance or a essential oil working in your batter, then typically it's going to work good in all batters. Uh, a good place to find fragrance oil online is sentimentalgifts.com and it's uh, scent like you're smelling something, S-C-E-N-T. Um, sentimentalgifts.com, they do test all their fragrance oils and I have not had a problem with anything that I have gotten from them. Also another place is brambleberry.com and uh, she's also known as the Soap Queen and she has Amazing fragrances it's on the pricier side, but uh, all of her stuff is absolutely wonderful. And there's one other place I found online, believe it or not, I found it on eBay. Um, I found it through somebody else because some of my viewers had sent me some fragrance oils, and that's how I found them. In reality, they're the ones that actually found them. Uh, but they sent me some fragrance oil from this place. It's called Fragrance Oil Gallery. And that's where I get my Egyptian Amber. It's the only place I have seen that sells Egyptian Amber. Another thing to take into consideration is, let's say one place that has fragrance oil has something that smells like Aloha. Or, and, and this one over here says, oh, we have Aloha too. And you get one from each. They're going to smell completely different. Um, it's best to, if you have a specific specific fragrance that you like to stick to the supplier you're getting it from because if you all of a sudden buy you know Aloha from another seller and it does work in your soap batter so your sales for that might drop because people don't like that particular type of Aloha um, another big one that people like is Dragon's Blood and I have had Dragon's Blood from one 
and dragon's blood from somewhere else and they do not smell the same at all. Even, th this is crazy. This is absolutely nuts. Gain, okay? Everybody, you, you've heard of gain laundry detergent. Well, a lot of people love the scent of gain laundry detergent. And I went into the store and I saw that they uh, had these Febreze wax melts that were gain scented. And I have gain fragrance oil. So I know what it smells like. I smell the ones in the store from Febreze and it's so light. It's not full bodied and it, it has a very, very small amount of gain fragrance in it. I was shocked. So that's going through Febreze too. So that just tells you, you know, no two are the same, even though they say they're the same. They're not. The recipe I am using, um, well, it's every, like I said, every soaper has their own recipe for how much you're making of every, how much oil you have versus how much the live water is. Every recipe has their own amount of fragrance that has to go in. And my recipe calls for, I'll tell you this, takes three ounces of fragrance per batch. Now when it comes to colorant, um, you can, I would not recommend, okay, I've done it before but I learned my lesson. <laughs> You don't really want to use liquid soap colors when making cold process soap because the chances of getting the color that you're using actually being the end result is uh, next to none. Let's put it this way. The first time I used liquid colorant in a soap mix for cold process soap, I used black because I wanted to get a black and white marbled bar. And I didn't have black in just regular powdered pigment, so I used a soap coloring. Well. The black turned red. So from now on, what I use is regular pigment is cosmetic grade pigment. You cannot use anything in your soap other than cosmetic grade. You can get really cool colors too. I mean like hot pink, um, bright, bright, bright yellow. This is almost empty here. Here's a a fresh one right here. Neons, you can get neons. I, I even have glow in the dark. Believe it or not, it's cosmetic grade glow in the dark pigment for soap and that came out very nice. The bars really do glow in the dark. It's pretty cool. What I'm going to use here for Egyptian Amber though is a yellow oxide pigment and a little bit goes a long way. Okay. So what I'll show you I use about that much for my batch. Every, every size batch is different. But this is uh, yellow oxide, it's a matte oxide, cosmetic grade pigment. Now, there's a pigment out there that's white, it's called titanium dioxide. And you have to be very careful when you use this pigment. Some is saleable by oil which you could just put it right into your oil mix once it's already been mixed together without the lye water in there. Um, others are soluble by water. The problem with um, titanium dioxide is there are some cancer causing qualities in it that the state of California has recognized. Um, a lot of people don't like that. The titanium dioxide that I get, you can get it where it doesn't have that where it's completely safe and that's the kind that I have. So you have to really look about what you're buying before you buy it. Now with any kind of uh, pigment you want to put uh, about, if you're mixing it separate, if you're making several colors, you need to have about a tablespoon of olive oil as a carrier oil in a little cup and I have my little cups here for whenever I'm making more than one color tablespoon of olive oil and then you put your pigment in there and you mix it up and then that's what goes into the separate containers that you're pouring your soap into to make different colors and then do your thing. If you're doing just one color you can do what I just did and put my pigment directly into the oil. As you can see there it is on the bottom and uh, it's not hurting anything, it's fine, it's going to make a nice yellow color to the soap and uh, you put the pigment in, when you're doing it this way, you put the pigment in first and then you put your lye water in. Okay, my soap stuff here, my, my lye water and my oils are at the right temperature. 
So time to suit up. You gotta put your rubber gloves back on. Because even with this being emulsified and saponification happening, if you get some on you, it can burn. It needs to set up and cure so that doesn't happen. So, goggles on. And I am going to very carefully pour the lye water into the pot. And I hope you guys can see that. Very slowly. You don't want to pour it in really fast because you don't want the bubbles. Okay. And what you do is make sure you have take, take the pot, tilt it on its side, shake the stick blender, make sure there's bubbles that are not in there anymore, and pulsate. Your soap batter is like that of pudding. Um, and you want something that's called trace. You need to reach trace with your soap batter. I'll show you what that is shortly. Fragrance oil goes right in. I always have a garbage pail nearby. <laughs> Three ounces. There we go. Okay. I have reached trace and let me show you what trace is. When you pull the stick out, see how it leaves a, the mark there, a trace mark? That's trace. What I got right now is about a good medium to medium thick trace. That's perfect for pouring. So let's take it on over and uh, pour it in our mold. This is my mold right here. It is lined with freezer paper. You can use parchment paper, but I don't recommend it because you'll get lots of funky lines in your, uh, your soap. So you want to line it with uh, freezer paper, shiny side towards the soap, okay? I also have another one here I did earlier, and I have a covered. There's a rock on top. This is another batch of uh, Egyptian amber. So let's get this one poured right here. And when you pour, you want a nice even motion going back and forth and pour slowly. And this is where you grab your spatula. Last thing you want to do is waste any soap, so make sure to get all that out of there. And believe me, a spatula works wonders. Don't worry about it being too high in one spot than the other because you're going to fix that in just a minute and you're not going to use the spatula to do that. I mean you could, but what I'm doing is going to even it all out anyways. Okay. Now what you want to do is you want to take your whole mold and do that. Slam it down. You guys are moving with it. You have to do this to get any air bubbles that might be in there out of there. What I do is I cover up the soap. You run a less risk of having it uh, overflow if you have it covered up. And also the soap needs to insulate. It needs to go to gel phase. And what that means is the uh, soap will actually turn to something that looks like jelly. It'll superheat and then it'll cool down. Now what I do is I use a rock to cover it up. 
and I don't want it too close to that one because that one's already gotten superheated. Yeah, I can feel it. And this one needs to get superheated as well. In the summertime, I can get away with doing this. If it was cold in the wintertime, I would need to use a towel, like so, and insulate each one of these to uh, keep the superheating going in there without having any, uh, any escape. Um, it's best to have a mold that has a lid. These are actually boxes that I got at uh, Hobby Lobby. You can get them at Michael's Crafts as well. And I just took the, uh, the hardware off of it and it works as a perfect soap mold. So you don't have to buy expensive soap molds. You can get away with it going to Hobby Lobby. And especially if you have their 40% off coupon. Because uh, you can get online on Hobby Lobby, print out a 40% off any one item, regular priced. And these things are like $7.99, take 40% off. There you go. You got a soap mold. So as you can see, I have several soap molds. Here's another one that's ready, lined, ready to go. But uh, you definitely want to get a good gel phase. And no matter how tempting it is, try not to keep lifting up the lid looking at it because that's a good way to develop soda ash. Okay, soda ash is a white substance that forms on the top of soap when it's curing. And uh, it's harmless. It's just aesthetically not pleasing. And I got sweat pouring off of me, I know. Um, but uh, yeah, it's... Once the soap has cured, you can try washing it off, you can cut it off, scrape it off, whatever you want, or you can just leave it. But it's not hurting the soap at all. It's just a white um, film that goes on the very top of the soaps. So that's how you do it. And what we're going to do is we're going to come back tomorrow, and these will be ready to cut tomorrow, and I can put them where yeah, I have my soap curing. Because uh, let me show you where I have it curing now and you'll have a good idea of what you need to have uh, for soap curing to avoid any DOS, which is what we call the dreaded orange spots. And I actually have some in this garbage pail to show you exactly what a dreaded orange spot is. Whenever you store your soaps, even before they're cured, while they're curing, and after they're cured, they have to be in a climate controlled area. You cannot have them too hot. And what happens is when you're, <laughs> what happens is when your soaps get really, really hot over a length of time, um, you end up getting DOS, which is uh, the dreaded orange spots. And what it is is the, the soap, the oils in the soap basically have gone rancid. If you develop DOS on any of your soaps, even in one little spot, that bar of soap is no good. You got to get rid of it. You got to throw it away. So this is what DOS looks like. This is a sliver that I had cut off the end. As you can see, it's the end piece right here. And I just had it laying on the racks in here because I'm, I don't sell them or anything. But you see all these spots on here? It's kind of hard to see in this light, but those are orange spots and that is DOS. It has gone completely bad. The whole backside is actually covered in it too. You can see that. But uh, yeah, once it does this, it's is bad. Can't sell it. Can't do anything with it. It ends up in the garbage. Okay. In here is a little Arizona room. And uh, I'm going to put the light on. What we had to do, because I was starting to have a problem with DOS, and I'm like, uh-uh, I'm not throwing all this money away that I just did all this stuff. We had to block out the sunlight the best we could. Alright? Our fragrance oils are in here. All my fragrance oils that I use for soap making. And my soap is in here. These are all the bars of soap that I've made. Uh, I've made a lot more than this, but we just did a craft show, so we sold quite a bit. And uh, I got the air conditioner on right there, and that keeps it cool. In the wintertime, I can easily take this and move it into the garage. It'll be fine. Even though the garage isn't heated, it's okay for it to get cold. It's not going to freeze in there. If you're in somewhere like Minnesota, you might want to put a heater in the wintertime wherever you're keeping your soaps or keep it in the common areas. Um, I also have melt and pour soaps here. I've got bath fizz soaps. I've got my bath bombs. It's another thing that needs to be, uh, yeah, there's bath bombs down there. Bath bombs, bath bombs. Um, those have to be in a climate controlled area as well because if they get too hot they will crack. These are soap bags. These are made with 
uh, slivers and ends and tops of these soaps all mixed together into a soap bag which works great as a scrubby this really scrubs your hands clean and these are uh, what I call my sweet and spicy mix they smell absolutely amazing so those are on Etsy too <laughs> it's always good to have an Etsy shop so this is how we have all of our soaps here at one point both these shelves had soap full on them but we sold a lot during the craft show so that's why you got to make more and stay on top of it also soap takes anywhere between four to six weeks to cure depending on where you live out here in Arizona it's really dry so it takes about four weeks for it to cure here um, if you're in a human environment it's probably gonna take six if not eight weeks for your soap to cure because what happens is when the soap cures it shrinks the water content inside the soap evaporates out and the bars actually shrink you don't want to label your bars like I do I got cigar bands we call this a cigar band on soap we don't um, label it until after it's been cured uh, because that bar is going to shrink up and the label will just fall off if you do it too soon so you can't you cannot use your soap until it is hundred percent cured um, because the uh, saponification process even though usually all that happens within the first 24 hours while the bars while the soap sits there and it hardens to where you can cut it into bars um, there's sometimes some leftover lie in there that needs to react with the uh, oils and the soap and it takes time for that to happen so that happens during the process of the curing when it starts to lose its water content so yeah this is our little setup here um, doesn't look the best in the world but it's the only place in this house that doesn't have dogs running around or people moving around it and it can stay here free of any um, disturbance or anything like that with an air conditioner in the wall and I got a box up there to direct the air exactly where I want it so that's all right okay so we'll come back tomorrow into the garage and take a look at the soap and cut them into bars so you can see exactly how it comes out it is now the next day and I took uh, both of my both of my logs of Egyptian amber soap out of the mold so let's go ahead and peel off this paper and see what we got. Beautiful. That looks wonderful. Okay, let's have a look see here. Perfect cut, sliced through it absolutely beautifully, and here's our soap. One of the things I love doing with uh, soap making is actually cutting the soap. Some people use soap cutters, personally, I like cutting it by hand. So that's what we ended up with, um, beautiful bars of soap. And I'm going to cut these up and get them uh, in my air-conditioned room. So there you go. Egyptian Amber Cold Process Soap. That's how you make it. If you have any questions, uh, any comments at all, just leave them in the comment section below. If you want to visit my Etsy, you can see the uh, link is also in the description of this video. And you can go check out the soaps that I have on there and all the other goodies. Alrighty. You guys stay awesome. Bye-bye.